So far, we've talked about the idea of being able to estimate population parameters from sample data when it's just not feasible for us to examine an entire population. But that's only one of the things that we might want to be able to do. A lot of times what we want to be able to do is have some kind of data-based decision-making process in place. And it's not necessarily about estimating population parameters then. We want to be able to put forth a question and have a data-based answer to it to be able to make some kind of decision in science and engineering, right? So to do that, we use a process called hypothesis testing. Now, a statistical hypothesis is an assertion or conjecture concerning one or more populations. Assertions or conjectures, that's what a hypothesis is, and the statistical part is that it concerns more, one or more populations. Now, when we do hypothesis testing, we can never actually be certain if our hypothesis is true or false if we're using a sample. We would have to examine the entire population to do so. But a lot of times it's not feasible to look at the entire population. So instead what we do is we collect a random sample from the population that we're interested in. And that random sample is going to provide our ev us evidence that either supports or does not support our hypothesis. Now, if that evidence that we've gathered is inconsistent with the hypothesis that we've made, that leads to a rejection of the statistical hypothesis. Now, if the evidence that we gathered is somewhat close to what our hypothesis was, we will actually won't reject the statistical hypothesis because the rejection of a statistical hypothesis implies that the sample evidence refutes it. Again, we can't be certain that it's not true, but the evidence that we've gathered makes it very clear that the hypothesis is very unlikely to be true. So the rejection really is telling us that there's a small probability of us obtaining the evidence that we got from our sample if in fact the hypothesis was true. So that's why we reject it. Now, that means that acceptance of the hypothesis doesn't really rule out other possibilities. It just means that the data that we got was close enough that like the probability of us getting that, given that our hypothesis was true, is high enough that we can't outright reject it. That means that when we do hypothesis testing, rejection is our firm conclusion. So when we go to make a statistical hypothesis, we need to basically hypothesize the negation of what we're interested in knowing. So if I want to know if students improved from a pretest to a post-test, I would make the hypothesis that the students did not improve from the pretest to the post-test or did not change from the pretest to the post-test. And then if I manage to reject that, then that's giving me evidence that says that I found evidence that a change actually probably happened. If I instead hypothesize that a change happened and I didn't find evidence to refute that, to reject it, I, I can't really outright accept it. That The possibility that no change happens still exists. So we want to word our hypothesis that we're interested in testing as the negation of the thing that we really want to know a lot of times. So the way that we formalize our statement of a statistical hypothesis is very important. We're going to look at that right now. So when we're doing hypothesis testing, we have two hypotheses we need to talk about. The first is called the null hypothesis. And the second is called the alternative hypothesis. Now we denote the null hypothesis with an H with a subscript zero and our alternative hypothesis with an H with a subscript one. Now, the null hypothesis gets its name because it nullifies or it opposes the alternative hypothesis. 
And the alternative hypothesis is actually the theory that I want tested. It's usually the question that we want answered. So I go through and I do my hypothesis test. Well, what is the outcome of the hypothesis test? Well, there are two options. First, we can reject the null hypothesis. When we reject the null hypothesis, we're rejecting it in favor of the alternative hypothesis because there's some kind of sufficient evidence in the data that we gathered to tell us that the null hypothesis is very likely not true. And since our alternative hypothesis is the opposite of our null hypothesis, then our null hypothesis not being true makes our alternative hypothesis very likely true. Our other possible outcome is to fail to reject. our null hypothesis. Now notice that this is not an acceptance of our null hypothesis. We never in hypothesis testing actually accept the null hypothesis. So failing to reject the null hypothesis means that there's insufficient evidence in our data to actually reject it. However, we can never have sufficient evidence to actually accept it. Because of that, when you're setting up your hypothesis test, like I said before, you'll, your alternative hypothesis is the one that's the question you want answered, and the null hypothesis is the negation of that. So let's look at an example. Consider the situation of a jury trial. So if we want to know if a defendant is guilty or not guilty, we could look at statistical evidence and determine how likely it is that they're guilty. Now we don't do this in real life because a lot of times there's a lot more evidence beyond what we can put into statistics here. However, let's look at this. So the defendant comes up on charges. That means that there was the suspicion that the defendant is guilty. So what we really want to test is whether the defendant is guilty. So that means that our alternative hypothesis should be that the defendant is guilty. If that's the question we really want an answer to, then we're going to have our alternative hypothesis be that he's guilty. Now, if in fact we want to know this, we actually test on the null hypothesis that is the opposite of this. So the opposite of guilty is innocent or not guilty. So our two possible outcomes is we're going to reject our null hypothesis. So we will reject the idea that the defendant is not guilty, which is in favor of the fact that he is guilty. So rejecting the null hypothesis because the alternative hypothesis is always the negation of it, the opposite of it. Um, if the null hypothesis is rejected, then we have our alternative hypothesis as our statement. Our other possibility is that we fail to reject our null hypothesis. So if we do that, then there's a chance that the defendant is not guilty and there's a chance that he's guilty. We don't actually know. So the failing to reject gives the possibility of not guilty, and this comes into our criminal idea of the beyond a reasonable doubt. There's a reasonable doubt there, and so the criminal could, in fact, be not guilty, or the defendant might not be a criminal, right? Um, so that's the idea here. We can reject it, or we can fail to reject it. and. Our alternative hypothesis should be our question. The null hypothesis should be the negation of it. So when we're conducting hypothesis testing, the variable that we're basing our decision on is called our test statistic. So in this case, I have 
a variable x that I'm going to base my decision on. It's the one that's involved in the hypotheses that are being made. And I've represented it here. It's going to be on a number line. Now, when our null hypothesis is that x equals a certain value, say it equals some value in this region right here, then there's going to be this buffer zone around the value that I've hypothesized with my null hypothesis that my test statistic equals where I don't have enough evidence to reject my null hypothesis. So I'm going to fail to reject it. I'm not going to reject it in that zone. I've colored it in gray here because it's kind of a gray area. We don't know whether the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis is the case, so we can't reject the null hypothesis. Now, there's a value of our test statistic called the critical value. Here it's that big red line, all right? And that value is the first value where I'm going to, or the last value, depending on how you're looking at it, where I'm going to fail to reject my null hypothesis. Otherwise, I am going to actually reject my null hypothesis. So everything beyond that critical value is called a critical region. And in that critical region, I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. In this case, this is all set up with the example where I would have my null hypothesis is the test statistic equals a certain thing and that the alternative hypothesis is that the test statistic is actually greater than that value. In this case, this is an example where negative values for my test statistic are just not possible. Now, if in fact my null hypothesis was that, say, my test statistic equaled something, and my alternative hypothesis was instead that x was less than, then my critical region and critical value would be on the other side of that gray area that I've made. Like we've said before, hypothesis testing is not perfect. So when we do it, sometimes we're going to reject our null hypothesis when in fact our null hypothesis is true. And other times we're going to not reject our null hypothesis when our null hypothesis is false. That's going to happen because we're not looking at the entire population, we're looking at a random sample. And even if it's highly unlikely that we got the data that we did, that doesn't mean that it's impossible. So errors are going to creep in. When we reject our null hypothesis, but our null hypo hypothesis is actually true, so we shouldn't have rejected it. That's called a type 1 error. And when we do not reject our null hypothesis, when our null hypothesis is actually false, that's called a type 2 error. Now, we should be interested in the probability of getting these errors in our hypothesis testing. If hypothesis testing is going to mean anything, we need to know how likely we are to commit an error. So we actually are interested in this. We use a Greek letter alpha to denote the probability of committing a type 1 error. Now, this is also known as the level of significance of a test. It's also, also known as the size of the test. So to calculate alpha, what we're really, really finding is the probability that we got the evidence, so our x value, our test statistic, fell into the region, was in the critical region, to be able to reject our null hypothesis, when in fact h naught is true. So whatever our alternative hypothesis was that it's true. So again, we're looking for the probability that our test statistic, the value that we got for it in our sample, was in the critical region when, in fact, our 
null hypothesis was true. And to find this probability, it's going to depend on what type of variable our test statistic actually is, on what method you'll use. However, there's examples of multiple methods available for you to take a look at in your book if you're uncertain as to what methods you should be using. Take a look at those and get a feel for it. You've done all of these methods before in previous parts of the class. Now, calculating beta, or the probability of committing a type 2 error, is a little bit more complicated because our alternative hypothesis is true when our null hypothesis is false. And most of the time, our alternative hypothesis is not specific. So it has an inequality in it instead of an equality. And a lot of times that's difficult for us to look at with regards to probability with what our test statistics are. So sometimes people will choose specific values um, within the range of the possible values for the alternative hypothesis to get a feel for the probability of a type 2 error. Um, your, your book does that as an example. Um, but just know that that's a little bit more of a complicated value to find. Um, but again, you'd be looking at the probability that your test statistic is not in the critical region when our alter or our null hypothesis is false and in case our in that case our alternative hypothesis is true now if we increase the sample size so our random sample is larger then our likelihood that we make a type 1 or type 2 error decreases that is alpha and beta decrease those probabilities decrease as our sample size increases. Now, sometimes we like to be able to compare tests. One way that people compare different hypothesis tests is to think about the power of the test. Now, the power of the test is defined to be the probability that we reject a null hypothesis given that a specific alternative is in fact true. This should also be noted that when I was talking about the critical region, I've always talked about a one-tailed test. That is, we were only looking on one side of our alternative hypothesis. We sometimes test for both sides. So we're interested in an alternative hypothesis that says it's not equal to. And in that case, the critical region is actually split into two regions on either side of the null hypothesis. And that is called a two-tailed test. And what we talked about was a one-tailed test. Above all else, the best way to get a feel for this is to start diving in, looking at some examples in your book, and trying some problems, and reading about different errors, and trying to classify them as type 1 and type 2 errors, and then checking your answers along the way. So don't be afraid to dive in, get your hands a little dirty with this stuff.